Okay, good morning, everyone. This is Brittany Cartwright with the Palm Beach North Chamber of Commerce. We welcome you today to our webinar, uh, Preparing for Hurricane Season. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar with John Carr of r, r Industries and Chip Merlin of the Merlin Law Group. A couple of housekeeping items. We're gonna keep everyone uh, in mute only so that we can give both John and Chip the floor. And then um, we're actually gonna go over questions towards the end. You can feel free to send me a uh, message within the Zoom chat option. Uh, you can either send it to myself, Brittany Cartwright, or through to everyone, and we'll go over that towards the end. Okay, so now on to our uh, speakers of the day. I'm gonna go ahead and introduce John Carr, who is with r, r Industries and is our immediate past chair of the board. John Carr is Vice President of the Restoration Division of r, &R Industries, a commercial contractor headquartered in Central Florida since 1948. John Carr is widely recognized for his restoration expertise, and Carr brings many years of experience having worked on major projects throughout the state, including Hurricanes Matthew, Irma, and Michael, to name a few. A HAAG certified inspector, John possesses the resources to assess your property or damaged property effectively and with confidence. Without further ado, take it away, John. Uh, thank you so much. I greatly appreciate it. Hello, everyone, and welcome to part three of our three-part series. And I'm excited uh, today to have uh, my friend Chip Merlin with us. You know, when we were doing this series, I really wanted to make sure that we brought a lot of value to our members and everyone that was watching the series. And what a, I can't think of a better way to end it than have someone like Chip here. And so I'm gonna do a brief intro of Chip. I have this great story of how I met Chip. Um, he probably won't want me to go into it, but uh, you know, Chip and I met about five years ago at a conference. And when we met, you know, I was told, you know, this, you have to meet this person, you have to meet this person. I'm like, okay, well, I'll, I'll meet him. And he said, no, he's the guy that can help you solve your problems with all your insurance claims. And he's the legal counsel that you want to hire. And so the, the people that were trying to introduce me to him, they were, they were a couple public adjusters out of, I believe it was New Jersey. And they, they made it like he was pretty much the president of the United States. It was very difficult to get a hold of him and, and, and you know, difficult to reach him, which all is not true. It was, it was, it was, all I needed to do was walk up to him and say hello and introduce myself and everything would have been fine. I really didn't need the pre-introduction, but I got this great pre-introduction and long story short is we had some claims uh, where I worked previously and we brought them to Chip and, and his firm. And the best thing I can tell you is that Chip's expertise was able to help us resolve some claims that we had open that were open for a long period of time. And we flew over to his office in Tampa. Um, he's got offices all over the country, but we flew over to his office in Tampa and we laid out in his boardroom. We put the claim process up on the screen, the policy, and we just dissected this thing together as a team and was able to resolve this in a short period of time to you know, get the money that was rightfully owed to the insured. Um, and I was sold from that point on. I was like, this guy, I want to, I want to, I need to have him with me because my job, for the insured is to bring the team of experts because I'm not an attorney, I'm not a public adjuster. And, and so I need to bring those experts. And Chip is one of those experts I like to bring uh, to on the claims if he'll take them because uh, they're very busy, but he's got a great team of guys. We work with Sean Marker, particularly on that uh, claim and they, they did a great job for us. So with that, no further ado, I'm gonna let Chip take it over because uh, he can talk a lot more about insurance and how to make sure that you get what is rightfully owed to you from the insurance company much better than me. Chip? All right. Thanks a lot, John. I can see the reason why you're a, uh, in sales because you do a great job. Maybe yeah. I ought to take you around with me everywhere I go. Um, so let's keep moving on. I, I, I don't have the, uh, the ability to control this. So whoever's pushing forward, let's keep going on the presentation. Yeah, my law firm, we, we do have offices all over the United States. I've recently written this book called pay up it's a great book if you're having trouble sleeping oh my god buy the book it'll make you go to sleep you can tell your honey hey 
look what I've bought, the most exciting book in the world. It's all about insurance. But preventing a, sa a disaster with your own insurance company is what that's about. And let me tell you some stories. Ira Saracen is an individual there, and he is a, he, he's passed now. Ira was from up out of New York, Brooklyn area, and then spent a lot of time in Boca Raton. He was with Saracen and Sons, and he was an attorney who became a public adjuster. And when I left my insurance, property insurance defense firm in 1985, Ira Saracen was one of the first of two public adjusters to refer clients to me knowing this is what I was going to do for my entire adult life, and I have been doing for policyholders since 1985. And Ira sent me over, and it will go forward just to the next screen, a case called May's Fabrics. And at May's Fabrics, it was a great uh, fabric store. They sold fabric when women used to cut their clothes and make all their clothes for themselves. And I know some people do that now, but not like in the past. And this is what these guys sold all over the Southeast United States. And their business had gotten to the point where the sons are running the business and they let Pop who was in his 80s, and the old CFO in his 80s do one thing, take care of the insurance. And sure enough, the reason I had one of these first cases is because Pop and the CFO and the insurance agent put the amount for the main operation, which was across the street from a small part of the operation, and they reversed the values. And you can imagine when the insurance company said, oh, you have a fire at the main operation, but you only have this amount of insurance, and we're only gonna pay a pittance, to you, they, there was a mistake and Pop caused it. That's part of what I'm talking to you about today on that story. And getting it right is awfully important. So if we go to the next, is this your insurance agent? And is this how you found your insurance agent? I would suggest to you, if you find your doctor, your brain surgeon, or your insurance agent from who people like out on the golf course, that's not really the best way to find either your oncologist, your brain surgeon. And the question is, who's your insurance agent? Who do you want to be your insurance agent? And I often tell people it's the best person you can find, somebody who's professional. And if we go to that next slide after this, a, a person that, you know, is going to not do this. Hey, I can find you some really cheap insurance. I got you just the greatest deal in the world on insurance. And don't get me wrong, cost means something for every single business. But especially for insurance, you can find yourself being penny wise and pound foolish. And you need to have insurance people that have these three things I always take a look at. Credentials, experience, and success. And as a matter of fact, for any professional you would hire, it would be that way. Um, I often tell people on, on credentials, even the insurance agency, and I put this out here, the trusted choice independent insurance agents. They check, well, what do you mean by that? That's just a, you know, that, that's just a brand. And I, no, it's not just a brand. When agents have the trusted choice symbol, they require to get that, that their agents go through certain um, uh, classes that they have to do, that they have to pass, and they're raising their standards with respect to the individuals who are selling insurance. It's not based upon their handicap at the golf course. It's not how friendly they are to you or anything. It's, it is what is it that they know, how passionate about what they do. So if we go forward to the next slide. That is a friend of mine who is an insurance agent educator. Uh, and all he does is he helps insurance agents and he helps them to get better. He's written, recently written, I think this is his third book in insurance. And if you look down at the bottom, Bill Wilson's his name, and Bill's got these things, CPCU, A-R-M, A-I-M, A-A-M. When you go to pick an insurance agent, one of the first things I try to tell people, Chip, how do we figure this out? How, how do we know? Look for these credentials. You know, are they a chartered property casualty underwriter? Check those credentials and just say, geez, you know, this is the type of person, you know, we're really looking for. This is the type of person that I would trust my business with, with deciding the type of insurance that we should have in the event we have some catastrophe. Because you can't do it. You can't go back and change it after the fact. I have this photograph in here for this. And, and the reason for this particular one is I want to make certain because we're just getting into the hurricane season, but it's not too late. Make an appointment, have the best people in your company around and get your insurance agent and talk about your business and your own personal problems that you might need personal assets that you might need to insure. You know, and that goes from the business you've got, all the businesses you've got, the boats you might have, the cars you might have, the, the uh, uh, place down in the keys you might have. I mean, all kinds of things and go through your entire lifestyle. Typically, 
the more affluent you are, the more you need to spend more time with your insurance agent because you have more to protect. And that person won't know everything that needs to be insured and how it can help you without that individual talking to you. So please, you have a little bit of time, not a lot of time, make that appointment with that agent because you don't want to have this happen. And we had this picture, if you look at it, it's the Grand Canyon, and I was thinking about the biggest gap and the biggest insurance coverage gap you could have where all your dollars be going. And talk to the insurance agent. These words you ought to be, what insurance coverage gaps do I have? What gaps in insurance do I, uh, do I, do I have? That's, and, I, and I write that down. It's one of the biggest discussions in insurance right now. And most people think insurance policies are being written better, but they're being written with more and more gaps all the time. And you have to buy endorsements to fill in for what I'm starting to call Swiss cheese insurance policies. And by that, I mean, they might say this, but they take away that. In order to take away this other part of coverage, you have to buy an extra endorsement to get in there. It is confusing. It's the reason why you need a real professional to be helping you out and get this policy right. And now I want to talk about you know, some of the basic things, you know, to get around the Swiss cheese insurance that every single business person, uh, uh, anybody of means ought to be having a discussion with their agents. So let's keep moving, you know, past this. You know, one of the first things I talk about is, does this agent really know what he's talking about? And I put this thing in 100% or 80%, you know, and there's something in every insurance policy that you're supposed to do, do and that's insured a value. And if you don't do so, in the vast majority of all policies, they have what's a co-insurance penalty. And it's very counterintuitive. Almost anything except with respect to co-insurance, 100% is a lot better than 80%, except when it comes to co-insurance. And so I've literally heard some ignorant agents say, oh, I got my client 100% co-insurance and it costs a little bit less. Well, it costs a little bit less because there's a heck of a lot more of a penalty that has to come back about it. I picked this out. This is the Tierra Condominium. John, I'm certain you, you and everybody probably recognizes it over in North Palm Beach. I represented the Tierra Condominium after Hurricane Francis and Jean. Uh, it was hit by both hurricanes, and they had purchased a policy that provided that they only pay one policy limit during the entire time, and they didn't have enough insurance coverage. So when it got up to about $42 million, they said, eh, we aren't paying any more money. Now, we were quite fortunate that we went through and represented them and were able to double that within 11 months up to almost $90 million. But today, if, if a tier was to go out and they bought a $100 million worth of coverage, they would probably have a $3 million deductible. Because if you had a percentage deductible of 3% of $100 million is $3 million, where's that going to come from? And a lot of people don't even know to ask, geez, you mean I could buy down that deductible with something that's known as deductible buy-down coverage? And so if you have a very expensive piece of property, I want to make certain people ask their agents, geez, can I really afford this deductible or not? Can I buy it down? There's actually coverage to buy down these uh, very high percentage deductibles. And the more expensive your property is, you know, the higher that deductible is going to be, you can actually buy it down. The next thing I wanted to talk about and give an example of how an insurance agent can help you out. And this is just recently, there was a, a water loss to a, ha to a house out in Lake Worth. And we got a phone call about it and I noticed when I got the policy, like most policies, it's replacement costs and actual cash value, but the way most policies work is the insurance company will only pay you what's known as the actual cash value. And I'll give you an example. Suppose your shoes that you got, you paid $500 for the shoes and the next thing you know, you know, they're 10 years old, they might only pay you $50, okay? And they only pay until you go to replace it at the 500. For just $10 endorsement, that Liberty Mutual agent, a great agent, added on to our client's policy and endorsement that says they will pay the replacement cost right away. So those $500 you know, worth of shoes that were bought that you'd normally get paid 100, you paid the replacement cost right away, $500, and it only cost an additional $10 for that endorsement. Good agents are watching out for these little endorsements and making you aware of those, and sometimes, it can be for a small amount. And, and I think, John, you mentioned something even on a fence or something you had. I forget what it was when I was preparing this uh, presentation that for, what was it, $8 a year or something like that, $18 a year, you got um, tens of thousands of dollars more coverage. It was almost a no-brainer. And that sometimes was it was. It was $8, Chip. Now, can I ask you a quick question? I don't mean to interrupt, but 
Because sure. I, don't, I don't think a lot of people understand the importance of the RCV and the ACV, the replacement cost value and the, and the um, actual cost value, because we've seen it, and I know you've seen it, you know, hundreds of times where the insured is only insured for ACV. And can you explain that a little bit? Like another, and I know you, you did like with the shoe example, like so if the shoe, you paid $500 for that shoe, but you wore it and now there's a depreciation, right? Can you explain that a little bit to everyone? Sure, so the way it works under most insurance policies, even if you have a replacement cost policy, is that the insurance policy does not pay automatically pay replacement cost it automatically will pay you actual cash value, which means they typically take off for depreciation, obsolescence, wear and tear, you know, those types of things. And so it's some amount less. And it's becoming more problematic because it's not just with shoes, but it's also with respect to um, roofs and things like that. And I'll get to that in a second. So, you know, it, a lot of people think they're going to get paid 100% on the dollar so they can go out and buy the $500 shoes and replace them with $500. No. They're only going to give you $100, and as a matter of fact, some policies say you have to go out and do all that replacement to go buy those items within 180 days, which yeah. is nearly impossible to go do. So what this agent had done was by just adding this one endorsement. They say, we won't take the depreciation. We won't take the obsolescence. It's going to cost you $500 new for replacement. We'll pay you that right away. Now, where it's getting more difficult, and I'll go into this a little bit later, is we're finding some insurance policies like for older roofs they won't even pay replacement cost they only pay actual cash value so if you have a 10-year roof they want it and it's a 20-year roof and it's 10 years into it they only want to pay 50 percent for that which we think is wrong as a matter of fact most mortgages require you to have all the time replacement cost policies which means the they've got to pay the full amount and that insurance companies in the state of florida should not be doing this with older portions of structures and things like that. It's against most lending agreements. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that and things to watch out for because some agents, unfortunately the non, you know, the inscrupulous ones, oh, I can save you some money. Look at all you've got to go pay and it's really the same policy. You know, and that's kind of, I warn people, you know, especially at the point of sale, you know, penny wise, pound foolish. You, you really got to watch out for those things. For $10, this other, $10, this other client got back thousands and thousands of dollars just on their personal property items. So we'll keep moving along, you know, as some of this, because I'm going to give you some other examples. And these are things that business people especially have to pay attention to. Leases mean something. Your commercial leases mean a lot. And as a matter of fact, I think if we go to the next slide. I got an example on why leases mean so much you know, as well too. A bicycle shop is a great example. So suppose you own John's bicycle shop and it's running right there. You know, it it's, might be John's bicycle shop Inc. is the operating entity, but you personally through a different company also own the building and the land underneath, but they're two different entities. And typically what happens is your commercial attorney will send, have a lease set up that the bicycle shop pays back to your other entity an amount of money and what we find for rent every single month. And sometimes what I find up, we, we show up, we are uh, representing John's bicycle shop. And I say, where's the lease? And they say, well, uh, here it is. I said, well, this lease expired five years ago, guys. And you don't, you know, and it's a month to month, you know, lease as a matter of fact, and you get 30 days worth of interest for all the improvements that might be in there and you don't get paid the $2 million that you have it insured for. You should have made certain that the entity that owns the building is on the insurance policy too. And that's why good insurance agents make certain things like your leases. Are they up to date? They read your leases. They make certain that both entities are listed on the insurance policy so that you don't have those problems afterwards. And I recently have had some cases settled confidentially, but it, I don't want to have those things happen. And, and it, this is a great example. How many people that might, as you get more affluent, you might actually put your personal property into a family trust or into an LLC. It's not in the na your name anymore. It's actually into a separate name. Do you have both your names individually as well as the LLC or the family trust on your insurance policies? Have you contemplated that just to make certain that you're going to be able to collect fully for all your 
uh, additional living expenses and things like that. Emerald Lagasse, he was a client of ours after Hurricane Katrina. He had second homes all over the place. And, and he had actually done it right by making certain that all these various LLCs were, but he also had his name and that of his wife on every single place they went to. Their insurance was a dream. But if you think about these celebrities and sometimes you forget about it might be you that way, it prevents these problems from, from ever coming up. Um, divorce happens to people and you don't think about it, but when you move out, if you get separated, that has an impact upon your insurance. And most people don't think about that. Your insurance covers your primary residence where you intend to live. If you move out and you're not living there anymore, and that's no longer your primary residence, you're, you're living somewhere else, that has an impact upon your insurance. If it's just in your name and you move out and you're soon to be ex-wife is there, or soon to be ex-husband is living there, that has a huge impact. Anytime you move from one place to another could have an impact, and I gave this as an example because many of us as we're getting older are also taking care of our parents, and sometimes we're moving them from their place into an assistant living facility. When you move them out of their residence, at their home, that impacts your insurance, and that's a discussion you should be having with your insurance agent as to how do you properly insure that place that's no longer their primary residence, you know, any longer. And so you know, good insurance agents will be asking about this. The other ones aren't. What happens if you have a number of companies? John, even in my law firm, I've probably got seven different entities that we've now got listed for the various properties we've got. Of course, one of them being for my boats that I've got and stuff that we use as part of even my marketing and things like that. But you know, some people set up for their cars or in a different thing. If they have their own, um, you know, separate entities that might do things like the copying or they might be using various entities to do for their leasing of employees, whatever it might be. And when you have these types of companies, it's important for the agent to know about all the different companies and that they all get listed on the policy and that there's not somebody that's missed. I often find for businesses, they forget they have lender insurance requirements. You could actually be in technical default uh, for your lines of credit, for your loans that you got out there with not complying with lender insurance requirements. And so even on things for, uh, if you got lines of credit that might require it, and there was a, uh, uh, I'm thinking of a hotel that just recently, they, they, they found they didn't have a right to bring a claim anymore because of the way they had messed up on their lender insurance requirements. And you know, that was a case out of Louisiana making certain that even your agent knows what lender insurance requirements are with respect to the types of insurance that have to be purchased is extraordinarily important to businesses. So you're not in a technical default um, with respect to, to those lending requirements and all those things should be discussed with your agent. You should have an agent that wants to know about that. Now, one of the things, and John, this is where you come in. I also talk about what are you planning to do today for that disaster, that hurricane disaster is going to go in the future. And one of the things we've talked about, and I know your company provides, is no, not just the service afterwards and that you're reputable, you have credentials. Uh, I think you're, I was asking you, your firm has been around since 1946. You're local, they know who you are, which is extraordinarily important because after major catastrophes, there's not enough companies like yours to go around. And if you haven't made these arrangements in advance, who are you going to hire? And are they coming in from out of state? And there's some out of state companies that do a great job, but you haven't vetted them yet. So vetting who it is that you want to have as your contractor beforehand and maybe to get them to do something like an assessment of your property before it's too late. Jesus, there's certain things we can do to our uh, windows. Even in the condominium that I'm living in right now, we just recently had them go around and add all the caulking, the rubber gaskets, you know, that they stuck back in to make certain that we're not going to have water coming in, you know, from the high winds that come up, or at least do the best that we can to harden our structures beforehand get photographs of everything that are taking or, or video of what the property looks like beforehand. There's not going to be any question that the insurance company is going to say that this is not well maintained, not taken care of. And for heaven's sake, if there is a problem, we want to get it fixed now before the hurricane comes then. So I think companies like yours that do this, I always tell people it's something you should do. You should consider the credentials of the insurance company, uh, of the uh, contractor. <clears throat> and, and John, don't take this the wrong way contractors and owners of property, they always seem to have difference of opinion about the quality of the work that's done, 
Who's the owner's representative? Who, let's go back to that slide one time real quick. Who is that owner's representative to watch over the John Cars and those construction companies to make certain those guys are putting every nail in there and doing it right and they're complying with construction specifications. Sometimes what we find after hurricanes especially is that the specifications aren't really laid out and they need to be. You know, what's the quality of the materials that are gonna be used, the quality of the labor that's gonna be provided, what time frames are they gonna do it? All these things need to be laid out and thought of in advance just the way you would do any other type of construction and sometimes afterwards that's not looked at. Think who's gonna make certain that the contractor's gonna do the right job and what are the specific specifications that they're gonna be held to to do a really top-notch quality job afterwards. You know, the, typically the companies with good rep, uh, credentials, you know, do that. So, so again, who's your representative after the storm? Um, we can keep moving along. Accountants mean a lot too. Uh, this is a picture of a gentleman, is Bob Glasser. Bob specializes in um, hospitality business interruption claims. 95% uh, of what he does, are business interruption claims, uh, fires, water losses, hurricanes, tornadoes, whatever happened to hotels and motels. Uh, and he's really good at it. He's been doing it over and over and over. And when you find people that are truly professionals like that, and it has to do with business income and extra expense, extra expenses sometimes never even talked to by insurance companies. And a lot of times there's a lot of gold that gets left on the wayside by this. And so I've got even a story about extra expense coverage that's almost included under every single business policy. This is a photograph of a doctor, and I represented a doctor who was in partnership with an older doctor, young and older doctor, and their place had a fire loss. And he came up to me, and the older doctor didn't seem so interested in getting back in business and all, but this young guy says, man, I'm just building up my clientele. I've got them. I don't want to, you know, I'm not going to wait for four months, you know, until this place gets rebuilt. What can I do? And, and so I got a phone call from a public adjuster, Iris Saracen's son, Steve Saracen, who's still out of Boca Raton. Hey, Chip, I got an issue here. Can you, I think the insurance company has to pay for him to go somewhere else. And so I told the young doctor, go find a lease for some area, you know, within a block or two. And he looked up the lease. He signed a lease. And the insurance policy paid to equip as extra expenses. And this, the equipment at this temporary location while they were waiting for the main location to get rebuilt. So not only did they have to pay for the cost of the lease, they pay for the cost to equip with brand new equipment over there while the permanent one's getting rebuilding. When it all ended up, four months later, what happened was they had both a, the old one that had been fixed and they even had an office that wasn't that far away, a couple miles away um, that they had leased. And so these doctors actually had two offices afterwards and the, the insurance policy was happy because they didn't have to pay as much lost income during the time because he was able to keep his practice up and going. That's the example of getting the type of uh, professional, you know, advice that is gold in insurance policies that I think that are left over, which leads me to you know, claim act advocacy and professional help that people might need afterwards. And if you go to the next slide, I usually say there's four things, you know, it's, you're going to do it yourself. You're going to do it yourself with your insurance agent. You might hire a public adjuster and public adjusters are people that represent only policyholders. Um, with respect to property insurance claims against their own insurance company. The insurance company has their adjuster, and these people are licensed. Um, there's a number of people, very qualified people. They typically charge no more than 10%, and if they want to charge you more, you can go find other public adjusters that will charge 10% less, or you can go get an attorney to help you out. And certainly on the more complex cases, you might need that. And cases that get more complex, like we have a case right now, and this is going to lead up to the next topic. Every insurance policy is a little bit different. The agent sold the Florida marketplace. I don't even think they knew this, that, it, that a policy that had an arbitration clause in it. And the arbitration, now all of a sudden, geez, if we have a dispute, we go to an arbitration. Oh, and the arbitration, let me tell you where it says they have to go. John, you'll love this. Not here in Florida. And these people are up in uh, Melbourne. They have to go all the way to New York for the arbitration. Oh, by the way, the clause in the policy also says it's going to apply New York law. And what most people don't realize is how you know, bad New York law is for consumers and how much more so consumer friendly it is here in Florida. And that's why the insurance company wrote it in that way, which then leads me to the next thing, you know, the legislature, because we could stop a lot of this if we have better consumer laws to even prevent this from happening. And so the legislative process is important. 
And sometimes the problems don't come up until after hurricanes happen and some of these other new policies have been coming out. You want to have, <clears throat> you know, the legislators are going to be pro-consumer because business people need pro-consumer le legislation just as much as people do. Businessmen are on the same side as lawyers. I gotta say that one more time. How often does that happen? Most of the time, my colleagues, for most business people, they're afraid of them because they're gonna get sued for slip and fall or malpractice or something like that. But when it comes to insurance policies, businessmen are on the same side of all consumers. As a matter of fact, because you have more at stake, you have more to lose. Typically, people that are more affluent have a lot more to lose from insurance companies not paying and paying on time. And businesses are on the same side, especially when it comes to legislative uh, mandates coming out of, the, out of the Florida legislature. And what we need to do is make laws and, you know, that require fast and full payment. We have some good laws here in Florida that make it you know, much better so than other jurisdictions. But you know, as the last thing is I want to talk about, you know, we'll have the election season coming up is to ask who it is that your legislator is going to be up there and want to make sure they're on your side when it comes. I actually go up and and testify almost every single year up in the Florida, either Florida Senate, Florida House of Representatives regarding consumer rights. And I typically try to bring some of my business clients up there quite a bit because for, they listen more to business people and the importance so we don't have policies like written here and make them illegal where you have to go all the way to New York to arbitrate your you know, property damage here if there's some dispute. Not every insurance company does that, but you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out you might want to go do it that way. Um, <clears throat> hurricane season's here, so I want to leave these last few um, notes for you, and these are the things, you know, again, I'm going to reiterate. Call your insurance agent if you haven't done so. When you call your insurance agent, and I hope you got a good one, it's not too late not to get a good one, you're going to talk to them about insurance gaps. You're going to go through your insurance policies. You're going to make sure everything's, you know, are right. Are the names correct? Do you have the values? You know, are they accurate? Because you don't want to have that problem afterwards about having Swiss cheese insurance um, you want to make certain if there are any missing coverages that you can buy, that you can afford, that makes sense, you have them there. Get a written storm plan. What are you going to do if the disaster happens to strike you? And if you have it written out, follow that plan. There's some great plans out there. One thing I often see that people don't have satellite phones. Remember Emerald Lagasse up there? And John, I have this great story. So we get done looking at his house out in past Christian. I'm walking back out to the beach. Um, and I'm talking on my satellite phone and up drives, you know, some guys in the steamer truck and they stop and they get out and they go, Hey, can we borrow your phone? You know, get this. Here's the federal emergency management association and their employees are asking to borrow my satellite phone. Typically after catastrophes, guys, they, your cell phones are not working. All the towers are down and stuff like that. You need to be able communication is the first thing you can't put a plan in place without communication. Get a satellite phone for at least two or three of your top people in your business so that you can communicate with one another. You need it, no matter what. Um, try to get those pre-storm assessments. It's not too late to do so. There are a number of good contracting firms that are out there that are doing it. John, I know your firm's one of them. We've talked about it. And one last thing, since you can't depend upon your insurance company to pay all the money right away, Where's that money going to come from to start the rebuilding, to keep the payroll going and stuff like that right after the loss happens? And there's been a lot of discussion. I actually tell people you should talk about having emergency credit lines available with your bank in the event it's going to happen. They'll ask to see your insurance and that you have the coverage for everything and that your deductibles aren't too big. But where's that emergency funding going to come from when you need it like that after the storm? And for businesses, that means a lot. So you don't get thrown out of business. It's rough enough out there that we're trying to get the, the coronavirus. The last thing we need on top of that is a disaster where we're completely and can't do anything about getting income for a period of time. <coughs> I think that's getting pretty close to the end of my uh, presentation. Oh, my book, again, Kindle edition, audiobook, hardcover. If you like to listen to things, it's a great, it's an easy read. I did not write it for lawyers. I read it for people. I mean, I wrote it for, for people. I want people to be able to read and understand from some stories about what's really going on out there. I believe in the insurance product, and I believe it's even more important for business people, owners of businesses that are living the American dream, hopefully being successful, becoming more affluent. The more affluent you are, the more this product is valuable to you, and you really need to know how to make it work for you so that you don't have a second disaster with your own insurance company. John, I think that's it. 
It's been a pleasure. I hope I've, I've given some words of wisdom and I, I take any questions from people. That's awesome. Thank you so much. And man, I don't think I've ever heard you talk that fast. That was pretty, that was good. I knew we needed to get it all in. I appreciate it. <laughs> you know what's the difference is maybe you were talking the same, but you weren't like walking the room, going from one end to the other, you know, keeping us all alert, you know? Well, it's a little, I, I, there's a lot there and I know people can go back through and take a look at it, but, um, you know, okay. insurance can be pretty boring to talk about. Let's face it. Let's, oh, let's just go hang out with our insurance agent, you know, and that's how come sometimes the insurance agents that do well are the ones that talk and are versus, I hate to say this, the real nerdy ones that are very passionate about something most of us don't want to talk about because most of the time we don't need our insurance until a catastrophe happens. Right. But when it does, you're going to be happy that you spent time you know, it's just like having savings that you put away and it's a smart thing to do. You can rest a lot easier at night knowing that you're, that you're covered when these things come up and they will come up in life. We all know that. No, they will. And I, I wanted to touch on a couple of things. I do have a few questions. I guess some people are watching this on Facebook and they've been texting, texting me and asking me questions. And I'm like, the last thing I want to do is get taught, get caught texting uh, while I'm in a Chip Merlin presentation by, by any means. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so HOA representation, you had mentioned that, or, you know, a, a client representation. I, I will tell you, I welcome that. I want, you know, the, whether it's an HOA or the building owner to have that, you know, the third party out there, whether it's an engineer or it's, if they, sometimes occasionally, not all the time, but occasionally they may even have someone on the board that is experienced in construction or a former engineer or a retired engineer. And I will tell you, I, we encourage that, that we want that other, that third party saying yes. So it's not just me coming back saying, hey, we did all this work and yes, it's great. Uh, everything's perfect. No, we have that third party. So if a contractor doesn't like that, I think that's a red flag. Like if, they, if they're saying we don't need that, then that's a red flag to me. I think we encourage that, that to have that third party to take a look and make sure that we're doing the work properly. Well, uh, and John, for, for that point, for anybody who is a member of an association or an officer or board member, it's even more important. You know, the first thing for the insurance needs and people ask, you know, what do you buy for an insurance associate for an, what insurance do you buy for an association? And I say the very first thing you look to is usually in the bylaws, they have exactly what it's required for all the insurance needs that you have to buy for all the other members. So don't find yourself in an error to mission or a director's mission that you haven't bought all the insurance. And so what I tell people with your insurance agent, you send them the bylaws and you tell them in that letter, please read the bylaws, make certain we have all the insurance that's required to be bought for the association, period. If you can't do it, let us know so we can go to an agency who will get us that insurance. And I've had Clients, when they send those letters out and there's a problem, that's the agent's fault, you know, for coming back on that. They're the professional. Point number two, usually after catastrophes and if there's going to be a significant repair job done, many associations require that there are either an architect or an engineer who has to approve the work that is going to be planned to be done as well as the work that is done after it's done that way. So those are two important things that typically are in most bylaws that ought to be checked on. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, you kind of touched on it again here. All these different, you know, aspects of these, like I know from my experience, the insurance claim process itself can be very complicated. You got to hire some experts. You, you need help. And, but just getting the policy sounds like it's a little complicated, right? If you have some different entities, you know, like, like Chips Ahoy, <laughs> right? So Chips Ahoy, that's all, I don't know how you write it up, but that's all business. I've only been on that boat working with you, right? You know, talking about claims and we're, that's, so to me, that's, that's your mobile office is Chips Ahoy. Chips Ahoy, for those of you who don't know, is one of Chip's boats. He also has this great sailboat called the Merlin. One of these days, I want to get a ride on that thing, Chip. But the, the thing with the, you know, getting the policies, right? So making sure you have the proper coverage. Do you always rely on an agent or should they contact an attorney and what kind of attorney do you think they should contact to take a look at that to make sure that because that seemed a little complicated well i, I think for um, most businesses uh the most businesses rely upon their general counsel or their cfo for the insurance and the risk management aspect of their business 
those individuals really should be looking toward a good insurance broker, a risk manager, and especially as you get more affluent, a risk manager where the person's actually putting together a package of policies that are gonna fit your need. And, and it, we're talking about property insurance and hurricanes here, but businesses with respect to you know, workers' compensation, with respect to umbrella policies, with respect to liability policies, defense, all these, the cost of just hiring attorneys when you get sued, your errors and omissions that might come up with you know, the board of directors on, on as the businesses get bigger, your crime and fidelity policies, all these various insurance you know, have a place and the, and the larger you get, the bigger you get, the more money you have at stake, the more important it is to get a more sophisticated insurance broker or agent. Often this is way beyond what an insurance attorney you know, can do. And, and sometimes I see people saying, oh, we'll help you with advice about your um, insurance without people fully understanding uh, the qualifications for you know, an associate in risk management that some brokers you know, have or a CPCU with all the checklists that they've got to go through various industries to make certain you're fully and properly insured. And if you decide to go bare, you know about it, but that's up to you. Yeah, great. Thank you. Great advice. All right, we do have a few questions here. So this one says, is it still the law that they can only write policies prior to a specific latitude and longitude? Um, that's not true, but when you get into marine policies, you'll find that for a lot of boats. <laughs> um, so for, for boats and yachts and for everybody, yeah, that, that Merlin boat was called Merlin in 1977 when I bought it. That boat's been all over the world. And it has certain places where I can sail it. And if I'm going to take it internationally, I have to let my um, a broker, you know, insurance people know about it, pay additional premium and things like that. Uh, I might want to add certain coverages depending upon where we might go. Um, but uh, typically, you know, you have two things you have to worry about in Florida. Um, and I'm talking about property insurance. And your property insurance, usually it's no problem except when you start having limitations on your wind peril that's close to beaches and things like that. So do you have enough, you know, wind coverage is not, not excluded. And then second thing, do you have flood insurance? And a lot of people don't know that today there's a very active private flood insurance market in Florida that's actually got some very competitive rates in many areas that some people should be checking out. You don't necessarily have to go through national flood insurance. And you remember like the Tierra that's sitting right there, you know, it, you know, it, 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 there's other buildings, Tierra would qualify under national flood insurance for a lot of flood insurance, but some, some businesses are, uh, think that they're limited to $500,000. That's the most they can get, and that's not true. They actually have something that's called excess flood insurance. So if you have a $10 million mansion over in Palm Beach, Singer Island, or somewhere along the water, you can get more insurance above what national flood offers if you'll ask your agent for it, a lot of people don't know there's such a thing as excess flood insurance that's available. So especially in Florida, I always, re if you're somewhere close to the water, you know, there's a chance for you that you're gonna get flooded and it's actually less expensive, very counterintuitive, it becomes very, very inexpensive when you're in areas that only have a remote chance of getting flooded, but every now and then they do. And I've been in some areas, you know, after Katrina, after Superstorm Sandy, people never thought some of these areas would ever get flooded. And when you're up 10, 15, 20 miles inland and they're still getting flooded, you know, it was really inexpensive to buy that flood insurance. I'm glad, you know, those clients were happy they had it. I think it cost me 500 bucks a year. But I, have, I have flood insurance because you just don't know. Back in 1995, right where this home is, was flooded. Um, you know, and it's not in a flood zone, right? Flood I mean, we, we've had, we've had, even after a major rainstorm that might not go away for a week or two in some development communities on golf courses, especially, and the water doesn't go away and it ponds up and the whole area is flood like inundated. If you have flood insurance there, it would, the, we have had flood insurance claims, even in golf course communities just for that. And people don't think about it. So. so All right. We got a few more questions here. So the other one was, uh, should renters be sure to have insurance? I think I know the answer to that one. Well, obviously they should, and 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 it, and the amount of insurance you know they should have is you know the how much stuff do you have? Some 
you know, some people that are running in some places, they're running in awfully nice places and they have awfully nice things. But one of the most valuable parts of renter's insurance is also the liability coverage that you have. So that liability coverage will cover your negligence wherever you go. And you, you mistakenly open up an umbrella and poke somebody's eye out and you have liability insurance for your renter's policy, which you will. It will cover you for the damage you do to somebody else and the attorney's fees that might come from an action from that. So absolutely, people should go get renter's insurance. It's usually very, very inexpensive. Yeah, when I was a renter, I, I always made sure I had it. It wasn't that expensive. It really wasn't. All right, we have a couple more here. What is the biggest mistake people make with property insurance? Um, being penny wise, pound foolish, and not buying all the proper coverages. I would say not shopping. Uh, for they stick with one agent, they don't know who the agent is. They picked an for especially for businesses. It's not treating their insurance as one of the most serious purchases they'll make and think about it because while it's so rare that you actually have a major loss when it does happen, you're really happy to know that you had a great agent giving you great advice and you're fully covered for everything that happened to you. I, I would say that's probably the biggest neglect of what you were purchasing before the fact. That's their biggest thing. Then after a loss happens is having so much ego that they think they can actually know what all these insurance policy terms mean and they can do it all themselves. It's sort of like thinking, really, you're going to beat the used car salesman at his own game by getting a great, he makes a living from this. Do you really think you're going to out negotiate that used car dealer? Everybody thinks they can because they have such a problem with their own ego. Your ego is not your hero. You got to let it go afterwards. And I sometimes suggest to people, you, you, especially the larger and more complex the claim, the more important it is to get professional help. Yeah, and that kind of answers actually the next question. It says, what are the most common problems people have with the insurance after a catastrophic loss? Well, besides them not paying the claim, right? That seems to like be the most common that I've seen out there is that they either pay or they, un or they don't pay or they underpay. They don't pay enough to actually do the repairs properly. What, what, well, is there anything else you want to add on to that? I would say the main thing that, that there's two things going on for commercial insurance to say, and since that's who we're talking to our businessmen today primarily, is people aren't getting paid enough right away. They need the money. Businesses need money right away. Cash is the blood to a business. You know, the same way our blood's to keep us alive, cash is the blood to a business. Where's that money going to come from if the insurance company's not paying it? You know, so it's getting quick cash is the number one problem. And I even addressed that in my speech about maybe you ought to be talking to get credit lines. You know, the second thing is you can't trust the insurance adjuster to tell you all the benefits that are available on your policy. And that's why I included the story, especially about the extra expense coverage that's there. Extra expense coverage might pay for certain things like additional advertising to keep your customers from coming back. It might pay you additional cover that you could go out and have a competitor provide product to you that you buy from them at a higher price to provide to your customer so your customer doesn't end up going to your competitor. How about that? But that's rarely discussed by insurance adjusters for two reasons now. Um, number one, it's not profitable for them to talk about all the benefits that are available under the policy. And second, the insurance companies don't even train their adjusters anymore about business income and extra expense that they seem to be so concerned about is not overpaying on the total amount of property damage. And so, you know, the adjusters out in the field don't even understand the businesses, their own customers' businesses any longer. That's, you know, you'll see it on some different ones with some major carriers like um, uh, FM affiliate, factory mutual companies that are around that really study their customers. But that's just not the way it is for 99% of most business policies and what most businessmen are going to face after a hurricane. Yeah, so true. And I'll tell you, after Hurricane Irma, um, we were on a very large loss over in Naples, you know, very large property. And I was walking around with the adjuster going over, you know, the damages that were there. And so, you know, it's just strike up a conversation with him. And he was telling me he was from Georgia. And I said, oh, how long have you been doing this? And he says, oh, this is my second stop. I was like, well, what did you do before? He was literally the president and CEO of a nonprofit in Georgia who answered an ad. And he went to some class in a hotel room and became an adjuster. I don't know how that how that works, but I was like, are you kidding? And, and he was literally out there writing up. Um, and we only spoke to him once, but you know, when we were out on the property, but I was like, holy cow, this, this person was the president and CEO of a nonprofit in Georgia three weeks ago. And now here he is 
um, adjusting a, a, a large claim. So yeah, was my, my, mine was a, uh, I think the craziest one I heard was a uh, minor league hockey player out of Canada who happened to got, you know, he was injured and he really couldn't go back to play hockey. And so three weeks after uh, Katrina, he goes down and gets their, his training to become a commercial claims adjuster. Yeah. yeah. After storms, there's such a need for adjusters. The insurance industry doesn't keep them hanging around, so they'll hire people on a temporary basis, put them through this crazy training. But, you know, I mean, they are not the professionals that you may otherwise get if it is not after a, a major hurricane. For many companies, if it's a one off and there hasn't been a hurricane lately and there's enough, you know, manpower to go around, you could get a very sophisticated general adjuster. But most of the time after hurricanes, you're not. You're getting what I call stormtroopers in. They often don't have a lot of training. They really don't care so much about your particular business. They're going to be in and out, deal with you for a few months, then give it to some desk adjuster that's going to be in Pahokee somewhere yeah. that you deal with. And it is just a different um, claims game that goes on after major catastrophes. All right. So I got hopefully... Brittany, you don't mind. I'm gonna, I got two more quick questions because, and, and then we can, we'll wrap up. I know we're running a few minutes over here. So one question, this is from Mike from uh, Melbourne. He says, are there any laws coming up that may hurt the consumer that we should be aware of that's happening? I think the main thing to be concerned about this legislative season, and I, I, I'm, I'd be concerned. Barry Gilway with Citizens Property Insurance Carry, you know, it is a difficult company to run, but they seem to be leading the charge with respect to pushing in the legislature, allowing for more and more Swiss cheese insurance policies to be sold to policyholders. Rather than fighting that and finding, requiring agents to um, find better coverage for policyholders, you know, we're, uh, we are allowing laws to be passed that, allow agents more easily just to dump it all into citizens and then citizens get stuck with this and the response from citizens isn't we ought to make it more difficult for agents to put the policies to us the first place seems to be we ought to dummy down our insurance and sell more swiss cheese insurance that's what i'm number one my biggest concern right now we need the laws especially that one that are now allowing insurance companies to take these arbitrations to foreign states applying different law than Florida. So even if we had consumer protections here, they do no good if, the, uh, if we allow people to sell insurance policies in the state of Florida that say another law state's going to apply. And we're seeing that a lot more. We, we have some work to do in the legislature to prevent that from happening. Well, you know, let me know whatever I can do to help you with that. That's a, that's a big passion of mine, you know, advocating for the insured. And I've seen a lot of those in, uh, you know, in the central Florida area where the arbitration you know, has to be held in New York. And that, that's not easy. That's not I mean, we, we even find, you know, and we found insurance agents, you know, because this is relatively new, didn't even know that the insurance companies had changed their policies to put this in there. Wow. And so they were selling, you know, some insurance agents don't read their insurance policies either instead of what they're selling. And I go, oh, you got to be kidding. That's in there. We can't believe that. And, you know, I am licensed all over the place. We have offices all over the place, but it is just inherently not right for you have a loss down in the keys and be jacked all the way up to New York City. It's a lot more costly. The laws aren't as good. The insurance company knows all that, and that's why they lowball people so often. I mean, the gig is in. And if you have an insurance company that's writing insurance policies like that, eh, don't buy it from them. If you have an insurance agent that's selling you insurance like that, Get a different insurance agent. It's, yeah. That's horrible insurance. So true. So true. And we've been seeing it. All right. Last question here. Um, this is pretty funny. They said, John, we know we need to hire you right away, but when do we hire an attorney? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's a good question, right? When, when do you hire? Everybody's it? just, oh, let's just go hire an attorney. I mean, it's like, hey, when do we go get to hire our cancer doctor? You know, I mean, it's not the thing you want to be hiring. You don't want to be hiring. A, yeah. Uh, typically, the more complex and the bigger the claim afterwards, you can hire attorneys even for a small amount to get some advice, right. um, which can help out. Uh, again, I also recommend people to talk with public adjusters out there because a, a good public adjusters can help a lot on property insurance claims. Uh, when there is this, a dispute, a denial or a delay for a business, that's the time 
to go see your attorney no matter what. Um, but, you know, certainly I, I don't dissuade people. And we get phone calls from former clients and, you know, clients in the past. I said, Chip, I want you on from the very beginning. I want you to oversee stuff, you know, for a small amount of money. And we help out on that too. So, um, you know, it, there's, there's no right or wrong answer for that. But I will say the bigger the claim, the more you should be consulting an attorney. So you at least know where you stand with respect to your legal rights. No, absolutely. And I will tell you, anyone that does business with me, you know, we know where that, you know, where that is. And for me, it's, it's sooner than later, but not too soon, right? That's the way I look at it. It's like, we don't want to get the, the claim where it's too far down the road, where it makes your job more difficult as an attorney to help the insured. Um, so I, I think for me personally, I like to, to keep you in the loop as soon as possible. And then when we need to kind of hire you and retain you 100% say, Hey, this is what we have. And then, then you basically, you take it off our hands and you, and you, and you get the insured what they are supposed to be getting, or at least you work towards that. And I see a lot of contractors out there that they'll, they'll fight the claim for two years, three years, four years, and then finally say, Oh, I throw my hands up. Got to hire an attorney now. Wow. It's too late. In my opinion, that's just my opinion. It's too late. You know, now damages are already done. You need to hire an attorney, um, you know, sooner than later, but not too soon. That would be my answer to that. And I appreciate you saying, yes, you hire me as a contractor right away. Um, but, and I, I navigate that, like what experts do we bring in, right? Do we bring in the window expert, the engineer, the roofing, what type of, um, you know, uh, thermal imaging do we need for the property? We put all that together and, uh, and Chip, I, I greatly appreciate you being part of that team with me. You know, I really do. You've really helped us over the years. I appreciate we, we like helping people. That's the greatest thing about being an attorney. If you like doing, you know, things you do, this is what we do for a living. We do a day after day all over the country and have a real passion for it. And so we see repetitively a lot of the same problems that come up and know how to answer those. Uh, but, you know, generally, you're right. The sooner you see somebody, the less problems you get into. But, you know, human beings, human beings are, I'm going to try to do it myself. We're often Johnny come lately to the uh, problem yeah. afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. Well, there, there was a claim we brought you guys in right away. For the most part, we had you review the policy. And then as soon as we got that denial, we called you. And you know what, that, that process moved a lot smoother than the ones that we brought you in on you know, down the road a little bit. So, well, I know this is going to wrap it up. We're, we're a little bit over time, but you know, Chip, I greatly appreciate you taking the time out. I know you have a very busy schedule and, and I really do appreciate you being part of this today and hopefully we can do it again soon. I hope this has been educational. I hope everybody uh, doesn't have that second disaster with their own insurance company. That's the last thing should happen. Anyway, thanks a lot, John. It's been great. Thank you. Brittany and Bianca, do you want us, or I think Brittany's the one that's on. Yeah. All right. Do we yeah, have, so do you have anything we need to wrap up with? Yes. Um, I just wanted to thank you both for the time that you put into this presentation, Chip. Thank you so much um, for participating with this. And John, I really appreciate you coordinating this and all of our uh, series of hurricane preparedness. It's very helpful to people who are in the area, uh, especially those who are not um, familiar with hurricanes. So thank you for your time today. Great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Have a great day, everyone. Yes, everyone enjoy and check out PBN Chamber for more events. Have a great day. Have a ha safe and happy holiday as well. Thank you, guys. We appreciate it. Bye. Bye. Bye.